So good afternoon, everyone, uh, wherever you are. I think most of us are, are after lunch already. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to our, our webinar on how uh, the, the health of the ocean is linked to human health. Uh, today, to talk to us, uh, with us, um, ab about this important topic, we have Dr. Sheila Hymans. I think I'm saying this right. Am I? Yeah, I am. Um, and she's the, the executive director of the European Marine Board. Um, and she came before that, she came from the Scottish Association for Marine Science, where she was the head of the science department. Uh, she has been involved with environmental impacts of fisheries and ecosystem change for 20 years and has published on a variety of topics ranging from the ecosystem effects of fishing, indicators of ecosystem status, the reason for species decline, historical reconstructions of ecosystem, and also the impact of fishing subsidies, which is also um, a subject that interests us, interest us very much. Uh, currently, Sheila's main focus is the social, economic, and ecological impacts of fishing in the world's oceans and uh, the resilience of these ecosystems to fishing and environmental uh, changes. Also, um, she is here today, as I said before, to, to talk to us ab about a bit how uh, our health, our very human health, is linked to the health of the ocean, which is not a new topic for us here at Siena, but still we are very much interest, interested in, in know, knowing a bit more about uh, this. This webinar is going to happen as our webinars usually do, which is we are going to have a presentation by Sheila. Uh, for about 20 minutes, I would say. And then we will engage in a discussion with our audience, um, with whoever wants to participate. We very much welcome your questions, your suggestions, whatever you want to say about this topic or other topics uh, ocean related. Um, we will be very pleased to discuss this um, with you. I just have to say that we are being recorded as usually also, and that we are going to make this uh, presentation, this, this webinar available in our YouTube channel. You, can, you won't be able to speak, you won't be able to, um, to turn off your cameras, but you can uh, reach us through the Q&A box which should be in the bottom of your screen. Um, if, you, if you want, you can also leave your questions on the chat box, but we would encourage you to leave them on the Q&A box, which will be, make it easier for us to, um, to uh, see them. I don't think I'm forgetting anything, am I? No? I think I have enabled Sheila to, to, um, to share her screen. Can you try it? It's working perfectly. You are muted, um, Sheila? Yes, I, sh I should have unmuted myself before I shared the screen. Okay. <laughs> it's always a problem when you do things not in the right order, then somehow you, you, uh, you can't find the button anymore. It's working now, it's perfect. Yeah. And you guys can hear me okay? Yeah, perfect, yeah. Okay. So um, thank you very much. It's really nice to be here to speak to you guys. Um, I hope it's not, it's, well, I'm assuming it's even warmer with you than it is with us. We're, I feel like I'm melting here. So um, anyway, but it's really nice to be here and to talk about how the health of humans are linked to the health of the ocean. Uh, for those of you who happen to be on social media, if you're going to be tweeting, please put the Marine Board in the tweets because it'd be nice for us to retweet. Um, and you can also use my hashtag as well. Um, so uh, I shall start by saying that, oh, I shall start by not looking at myself, there we go, I shall start by giving you a little bit of an overview of the European Marine Board. Um, we are a, a partnership of European um, major oceanographic and marine institutes uh, in sort of orange and brown, you can see where they are, research funding agencies in blue and national networks um, of universities that uh, perform marine research or ocean research. Um, uh, in red there, we have 35 members from 18 countries. We probably represent more than 10,000 uh, marine scientists and technicians across Europe. Um, and we are at the interface between science and policy. So we try to provide advice through different documents impacting both European research uh, area, research, the European Commission, for instance, but also national research funders um, and we also try to, to um, do 
you know, make sure that we can also reach the public and the, uh, and, and the scientific community at large. Um, we do that mainly through publishing um, a lot of documents. Uh, so we have three types of documents, three main types of documents. Uh, the first is position papers, which are bigger documents, which really encapsulate um, a specific topic um, with all of the background information. We did one on, on deep sea, for instance, the one that I'm putting that I put up there at the top is um, our um, flagship document on the future of marine science uh, for a sustainable future, which came out in 2019. Um, if you're interested in any of our documents, you can download them from our website. Uh, we also have future science briefs, which are smaller documents, usually about 40 pages, which kind of doesn't really give you a good review of the documents, but will highlight where the review papers are, and then just look at the future perspectives of where does the science and the policy needs lie. Um, but then we also have policy briefs, and so the one at the bottom uh, is specifically the policy brief that um, covers this specific topic. You'll see that I've highlighted the modeling one. I won't be talking about modeling, but that is really how I became involved with the Marine Board. Um, so our policy briefs are small documents, eight pages. We just made created one of 16, which is really unusual, but eight pages that's really highlighted, highlighting precisely the policy needs that we have. So that's kind of uh, our main um, method of doing that. Um, but we also participate sometimes in uh, European project. So the one that I'm going to be talking about today is Seas, Oceans and Public Health in Europe, SOFI. Um, and so we usually participate in these, in these um, uh, projects if they have a science policy link that we could, um, you know, where we actually can help. Um, so I don't have to tell you, I guess, too much about the oceans, but of course, Europe has an abundant ocean environment. We have seven seas, two oceans, 91,000 square, uh, sorry, kilometers of coastline. Um, half the population of Europe lives within 50 kilometers of the coast. And the ocean actually supports quite a huge uh, economy, 50 and uh, 5.4 million jobs. And we actually generate, the, the ocean generates quite a lot of money for Europe. Uh, the gross value added is more than 500 billion euros per year. So the, the ocean is really important and um, as, a, as a driver. Um, but of course, the ocean has uh, presents some risks and some benefits. So the risks are, are obviously things like storms and flooding, which becomes more important um, with climate change, for instance. Um, also harmful algal blooms and toxins become important uh, as, as time goes on. Microbial pollution is really important as a risk. And then um, chemical pollution, plastic pollution is, is more and more a risk that comes uh, from the ocean and to the ocean actually. Um, and the benefits that humans can have from the ocean is that it actually gives us health and well-being. Um, it gives you the seafood and aquaculture uh, uh, food that we need. We more and more now um, get renewable energy from it. Uh, there's a, a lot of marine biotechnology that, that's coming up. And most of the products that we have in Europe is basically transported by big trans uh, transfer um, uh, ships. So we have we get quite a lot of benefits from the ocean as well. Uh, I will say that the health and well-being was very much uh, today rem reminded me again, we are relatively close to the coast. So if I don't go for my lunchtime walk, I, I do feel that I'm, I'm not as um, enthusiastic about my work in the afternoon. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of links, there's a lot of positives and negatives surrounding the ocean. And in this paper by Laura Fleming, Fleming um, which was on fostering human health through ocean sustainability in uh, people and nature, um, she specifically looked at the links, the, 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 the interconnections between humans and, and the ocean. So here you have uh, positive impacts, negative impacts, benefits to humans, harm, harm to humans. And um, basically um, a positive impact, if there's a positive impact on a harm, then it could have a mitigating force. And if there's a negative impact on a benefit, then it could have a limiting force. So I would suggest that you go and have a look at this paper because this um, graphic, which you won't probably not be able to see very well on your screen, is a very um, dense graphic and, and has a lot of information in it, but uh, totally worth having a look at. Um, so oceans and human health as a, as a topic, as a, as a uh, sort of way of, of looking at the ocean or, or looking at research um, has been around since about 1999 in the US. So in the US, 
um, they had, um, they, they looked at it, uh, it became a thing quicker than it did in Europe. Um, but from the US perspective, they inevitably look more at the risks and not so much as at, at the benefits from the ocean. In, uh, in Europe, in 2013, we published a position paper on linking oceans and human health. Um, and again, you can download it from our, from our website, but we also had a, a message from, uh, from Bethildren and our Rome Declaration in 2014, both actually highlighted the importance of ocean and, oceans and human health. And those um, documents actually uh, led to the creation of two Horizon 2020 projects, Blue Health and uh, SOFI. Um, in fact, I will say that some of the texts that came out of our ocean, that, that we have in our Oceans and Human Health document came straight into the Horizons um, uh, proposal. So, so there was an obvious link. So you can see that over time, there's been a huge increase in the amount of work on ocean and human health that we've been doing in Europe, um, but also it's still going ongoing in, in, um, in the States. Um, so... Coming then to the SOFIE project, which is kind of what I'm going to be discussing for the rest of the time. It is a project that ended last year. Maybe it was before Corona. Corona kind of, I, I've lost a year. I think it was last year, beginning of last year it ended. Um, so in the SOFIE project, we looked at a diverse network of stakeholders across all of Europe. We focused not just on ocean health, but also on human health. Um, and we, uh, at the end of it, developed a strategic research agenda um, to cre and created a legacy beyond the program, uh, beyond the project by having a LinkedIn group um, and under the European Marine Board. So if you're interested and want to see more, then I, I would urge you to, to join that LinkedIn group. Um, obviously, it was an international project with mul multiple partners from, from across Europe, and you can see them at the bottom. It wasn't just um, science organizations. We also had um, tourism organizations, for instance. And we listened to very many different voices. So we listened to the public, to the medical and public health professionals, to the marine science community, to the tourism industry, and to policymakers. We brought that all together into a strategic research agenda, which we basically aimed at the funding bodies. Um, so the consultation pro, uh, process that we had spanned, you know, as I said, the oceans and uh, the uh, ocean health and marine health. So it spanned both communities. It was very transdisciplinary. Uh, we, we really tried to make sure that it wasn't just two silos working side by side. Um, and we had a lot of topic uh, workshops on, the, uh, on, on mapping some of the topics, the challenges and the opportunities, and all of that informed the SOFI activity. So you can see in this wheel here, we asked um, experts, we had a literature review of 18,000 publications, we interviewed 14,000 um, citizens, um, we had 66 policies we reviewed and so forth. So a lot of work went into creating the strategic research agenda. Um, in this um, slide, I'm just showing you a table that you can download. Uh, if you go to the strategic research agenda, it'll, you, can, you can actually look at the data. I'm not expecting you to see anything there. Um, but we actually had a survey. And when I say we, it wasn't actually work that the Marine Board was part of, but, but the wider um, uh, consortium. Um, had a survey of 14,000 citizens in 14 countries, um, and they basically highlighted the differences in the, in, in the understanding and the perceptions of oceans and human health by, by gender, age, income, and how far they, how, what the distance is to the coast. And the questions they asked were what their concerns were, whether they have positive or negative views of the ocean, uh, whether there's a need for more or less policy, a need for more or less research. Um, and they asked questions on issues such as fishing, medicine, recreation, and wildlife. So it was a very diverse survey of quite a lot of citizens um, in many of the EU countries. Um, we also held sea basin workshops, and I actually participated in one in the Baltic Sea, uh, where they asked uh, different questions about what is important to the people in the sea basin. Certainly, uh, the, the trends that, that came out were very different from different sea basins. So the things that are important in the Baltic, for instance, eutrophication, um, would not be important necessarily in the Mediterranean Sea. So the main, and you can see the different um, uh, sort of uh, trends and lines that we, the, 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 uh, that, that we discussed there. The ones that were the most important in the Mediterranean were agriculture, uh, the fact that everything is becoming individualized. Um, 
technology for health, healthy living, th those were the ones that were really important. In the Baltic Sea, uh, energy transition, governance changes, and uh, industrial technology were very important. In the Atlantic, um, the, the distribution changes in income, so the fact that in some parts of the Atlantic, the income is higher than, than others, and that it changes over time was important. Uh, healthcare transition was important, and blue recreation was also important. And then in the North Sea, actually the North Sea was the only one where obesity was something that they actually um, highlighted um, and aquaculture was also highlighted there. So you can see that the different um, sea basins had very different um, uh, things that, that, worry, that, that they worried about, um, about efficiency and health. Um, then we had these two expert work, uh, workshops. So these were uh, interdisciplinary international experts. So they were both marine scientists um, they were uh, medicine, medical scientists, but they were also policy makers um, from uh, twin, uh, 20 of those from all over the world. We had one guy coming all the way from Australia, for instance. Um, and we had two workshops. This was obviously before COVID, so they were in-person workshops. And one of the things that we concluded was that the current policy approaches actually can act as a barrier for oceans and human health research. Um, specifically, uh, the differences between marine policy and, and health policy, I think that became clear with COVID as well. Marine policy is very much at a European level, um, but health policy happens pretty much at a national level. Um, so, so certainly there were poli uh, policy approaches that were very different. Um, we also found that Oceans and Human Health doesn't have a single policy remit. The policy remit is, sorry, my lights have gone off, let me just wave at it. Um, my policy, the, the policy remit um, for oceans and human health isn't encapsulated in one place. There's definitely a lack of data and um, different stakeholders obviously have different uh, uh, priorities. Um, okay, and then in the, during the, the workshops and, and during all of the work that we did, we, we basically came to highlight three um, action areas. These are not the most necessarily the only important or possibly even the most important action areas, but they were the ones that we could identify as areas where we really needed more research. Uh, the first one was sustainable seafood and healthy people. The second one was blue spaces, tourism and well-being. And the third one was marine biodiversity, biotechnology and medicine. And I'm going to go through these three um, separately and, and give you a bit more of a flavor of what was said in those three topics. So for sa sustainable seafood and healthy people, Obviously, the oceans are an important source of food because, uh, because of the health benefits of seafood, but also because we have a growing population that needs to be fed. Um, and on the other side, we have an increased impact of pollution that, um, that has an impact on, on how healthy the seafood is. Um, but the problem is we don't have a holistic understanding of the health benefits that actually come from sea seafood, i.e. you don't necessarily know that the, the amount of selenium or something you get from a, a anchovy you catch in May versus an anchovy you catch in September might not be the same. So there's a lot of information that we don't have yet. Um, and we don't have this holistic understanding of how it will affect our, at, at, um, our ability to adapt in the future. Again, climate change might change these things. Um, so that's the sort of background on that. And when we uh, went through this, we came up with uh, a bunch of questions that need to be answered. And these are questions that we're hoping would be coming out in Horizon Europe, for instance, as, as projects. Um, so some of the questions that we had on the sustainable seafood was, we don't always know what the carbon footprint is of our industries, fisheries and agriculture industries. We don't know what the cumulative effects are of the pollution that, that's in our seafood. You know, if you, the, the cumulative effects of microbial pollution, plastic pollution, and, and harmful algal blooms, for instance. We don't have a good idea of what that is. Um, we don't know how pollution will affect the health of the marine ecosystems, the availability of the seafood, and then the health of humans. Um, we also don't always know, in fact, this is a, a big problem. We don't know who are, who's collecting the data, and we don't know whether the data is actually enough to update this, the policies, uh, specifically on human health. I think that's really um, one that, that that we have very little data about. Um, we don't know how much climate change will affect biodiversity. Uh, 
also if we if we create new uh, sustainable seafood you know not everybody's going to eat seaweed for instance so will the people eat the things that we think is more sustainable um we don't know what the impact um of climate change will be on the quantity and quality and the diversity of the nutrients in our seafood for instance what the imp what impact um, will changes in nutrients have on the health of humans for instance so there's loads of questions in this space between ocean and human health that we don't know very much about um, and then another one is how do we address the unequal access of nutri nutritious and safe seafood uh, uh, across different socioeconomic groups within a country but also across europe and across the world um, the second topic was on blue spaces tourism and well-being so obviously 26 percent of europeans report that they have mental health issues during the, their lifetime 77 percent of the disease in europe human disease is uh, non-communicable communicable diseases i.e obesity diabetes heart disease and stroke um, so of course that's a huge problem Physical activity we know can positively impact non-communicable diseases and mental health. Um, and of course, uh, engaging with the natural environment might improve your mental health or, uh, and might improve the mental health indicators. So um, this is a really important, very new space to, to be researching. So some of the questions that came out here is what is the different physical and mental health being benefits from interacting specifically with the coast and ocean areas? Uh, who actually gains these benefits? Uh, where do these gains, where do they gain the benefits? You know, does it matter whether you you uh, on the coast of Belgium or the coast of Spain, for instance, um, or if the, the sea outside your, your, that you're walking next to has any fish in it or not? Um, uh, who, who could actually benefit and, uh, in general, and do they have the access to benefit? So would it be possible for people from inner Brussels to have the same access as the people you know, from outside of Austin. And um, how much exposure do you need? Do you need to be there once a month or is once a year enough or is it better to be there once a week, that kind of thing? How will this balance of benefits and risks be affected by the impact of climate change and other global changes that we have? And how do we balance, you know, the access that we think we need to blue spaces with making sure that we don't put, enough, put even more pressure on the ecosystems? So these are the questions that came out of that one. Um, then the final topic is on biodiversity, biotechnology and medicine. Obviously, the ocean is the last frontier. Two thirds of the marine species still haven't really been dis discovered. Um, the marine diversity is the large, uh, largest untapped, untapped resource of chemical compounds and biotechnological products out there. Um, but obviously, species extinction is increasing. So we might be losing products that would be good for humans, but we don't know about it. Um, so it's really critical to describe and protect the marine biodiversity and pr uh, promote a resilient ocean so that we could have these ecosystems, ecosystem services into the future. Um, then finally, questions from this topic. Um, what are the links between healthy biodiverse marine environments and human health? How do we demonstrate the importance of preserving the marine biodiversity and function and ecosystem services for human health? How do we make people understand? Um, where actually do we look for species with compounds or properties of medical interest? It might not be the same, you know, off the coast of Belgium or at the deep sea. How do we overcome uh, sustainable supplies uh, challenges and how do we scale up production? So if we find a, a deep sea species that really could, you know, cure cancer, cancer, how do we make sure that we don't completely ruin the deep sea in order to cure cancer? Um, and what is the marine biodiversity contribution to fundamental bi uh, biomedical research and bio-inspired applications for human health and, and well-being? So those were the questions that came specifically um, on this topic. There were also some cross-cutting themes, but both the health of humans and the health of, of the oceans were important, obviously. Uh, there were obvious links to the sustainable development goals, and you can see on the, in the graphic on the right which goals we thought they were very important to. Um, and some of the cross-cutting themes that were also important across these three action areas were equity and equality, sustainability, the, the global change of pollution, how pollution is changing in the global context, ocean literacy and citizen science, and then innovation and employment. Um, then finally, some of the main recommendations that came out is that the sector um, should collaborate and share data and best practices. 
we really need to empower citizens and stakeholders to help with collecting data and policy making. We need to ensure that everyone has access to blue space and raise awareness of oceans and human health through uh, community building and training. Um, from a cost, uh, we also need to have cost benefit analysis to understand the benefits and trade offs of marine monitoring, because I think that's something that is very not very well known. Um, and we need to put data from different sources together to get ocean and human health indicators, which don't exist yet. Um, then some priority areas, we really need a transdisciplinary forum to encourage collaboration uh, between ocean researchers and human health researchers. We need the best practice guideline, guidelines um, on collaborating with stakeholders and citizens. Uh, we need a systematic and long-term study to identify the gaps and the linkages. Um, we need to demonstrate the benefits of marine protected areas for human health, because it's obvious for ocean health, but it's not always known for human health. Um, we need to uh, have transdisciplinary uh, education programs in ocean to human health. We need to make sure that we have young contribution and engagement involved. We need to advise policymakers on the data monitoring and indicators that's needed for oceans and human health. Um, and then some specific ones, healthcare really should, should focus on prevention and not on cure. We need to highlight the inequalities and the, uh, you know, that, that exists a, a, and that might arise as part, part of the decision making. Uh, we need to create a culture and, uh, that supports ocean and human health implementation and sustainable use. Um, and health and sustainability and the environment should be present in all policies. Um, at European and national level. Um, so just finally, we then, as I said, we have this policy brief, which summarizes, uh, you know, the real policy uh, needs uh, for specifically interdisciplinary international funding. Um, we need to make sure that the medical, public health, marine, environmental science communities work together. We need transdisciplinary training, and we need to really co-create and engage with um, communities with the, with the public communities, businesses, NGOs, and, and government. Um, you'll see throughout the project and uh, throughout the talk, I've um, highlighted some, there were some cartoons. These cartoons were created by Jacob Bentley, and you can again download them from our website. Um, so it, it could be encapsulated. And if you need, if you want to hear more, uh, we also had a webinar um, in the Ocean Decade virtual series, which you can download from YouTube and listen to. Um, and you can, as I said, uh, follow, follow the LinkedIn group um, if you have any more questions. So with that, actually, I'll, I'll go back and I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Sheila. Um, so myself, me, myself, I have uh, some questions here. Um, maybe you can stop to sharing your screen or do you want us to uh, to have this? OK. Yep, I'm happy uh, to stop. OK, OK. Uh, so um, well, first of all, thank you so much for your interesting uh, talk. This was quite new to me. I had I had seen a study by Laura Fleming, I think, and um, and it was what caught my eye. And I think that this is a very very interesting topic. And uh, as you showed, we still have a lot of things to understand and a lot of things to to study. A lot of subjects that need to be studied. A lot of questions that need to be answered. And to me, that was the most interesting thing here was to see that we have a lot to learn still. Um, and that's that's my first question, and then I will address the other qu question that we have here at least. Um, uh, in terms of, fu of future work, uh, did this project have any continu continu continuity? Continuity? I don't know if this is the right word. Um, um, yeah. So yeah. Um, so from a from a EU perspective, this was a SCA. A, a remember what it stands for but it was basically the project was just to create a strategic research agenda so um from 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 the the, the project group that that uh, ran the project we would love to continue working on it but at the moment there hasn't been any follow-up projects that you could um could do uh, in europe I know that Laura is actually doing something similar in asia um so there is a there's a different project who I can't I can't remember the name of, but um, if you go onto her website, um, she 
she has um yeah so she's she's doing a similar project in in asia so there's there's some related projects at least um but we're we're really hopeful that some of these calls will come out to horizon europe and then we can actually address some of these questions yeah yeah, I can only imagine how different and how similar, uh, to be honest, those those results are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I still have some questions, but then uh, we can we we can go for Katarina's uh, question first. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll try to prioritize the the questions from the from the attendees. Hi, Shayla, yeah. by the way, I did it. It was myself earlier. Uh, but yeah, we'll go towards the, the questions from the participants. And I'll just remind everyone that you can continue dropping any questions or comments in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll see if we have time to go all through all of them, but please feel free to do so. Uh, so our next question comes from Katarina Abril. Thank you, Katarina. Um, so she says, uh, the question is, could echo uh, anxiety, for example, towards plastic pollution and polluted coastal areas undermine the mental health benefits we gain from interacting with the marine environment? Easy question to start. Um, I think yes. Um, will it completely negate it? I don't know. I think that really depends on the, that's a, that depends from person to person. You know, some people have are more anxious than others. Um, I certainly find that when I go for a walk on the beach and I see a lot of plastic, it really annoys me, but it doesn't stop me from going to the beach. Um, so, yes, I think eco anxiety is, is, is really big and I, I don't, I, I'm definitely no psychologist, so I have no idea, but I think that it is probably something that is being studied, I would imagine. Um, so I, I think it would it definitely would have an impact on, on on the benefits that you could actually get from from being in these blue spaces for sure yeah um. yeah um also regarding that topic uh, something that that i was i was interested in is uh when you mentioned the the dimension of mental health and you did in this in the second yeah i, th I think it was in the second theme that you showed I, I can, I suspect that uh, because this project was done before COVID, right? Because most, most of, the, of, of, of the work was, was done before COVID. And uh, I think it's, it's very intuitive for me that um, the, the ocean and, and the coastal environment can have a, a smoothing uh, effect on us. Um, and I would be very interested in knowing if you have any indicators uh, of how people, um, not, not indicators because, because you cannot foresee the future, but do you have any, um, I don't know, feeling about how these results would shift if we did these exact same questions to people after we were in lockdown for one and a half years, do you think there would be any differences? Personally, I think the, the health and well-being one would become significantly, you know, it would be a much bigger part of the story if we had to do it again. I will say that um, uh, I know that with COVID, the, the, the researchers, we're situated, the Marine Board, we're actually hosted by the Flemish Research Organization here in Austin. And I know that they are actually doing research specifically on the impact um, of, of uh, you know, human health um, at, during COVID. So they had, you know, they had basically, I think they had some funding to do research on oceans and human health you know, how do you perceive the ocean? Or do you prefer a, a, a I, know, I remember the questions they were asking were things like, do you prefer a beach with beach chairs or without? And, you know, what is, do you prefer a beach, you know, with plastic pollution or without? So they're doing those kind of um, uh, studies. Um, but then I think they shifted, whether, whether they shifted their project or whether they have another project that's also possible, but they specifically looked at the benefits of living closer to the coast during the lockdown. So, you know, people who lived close to the coast and still could go for a walk on the beach because we had the, you couldn't, you couldn't go to the next town, for instance. Um, they, they did some studies to, to look at the health benefits or how, how much anxiety people had at the coast versus inland. So they, they showed those, those kind of, you know, that being close to the coast really helped being able to go to a, to, to the beach. I have to say that it's true for all, 
for all nat nature spaces. It's also true for um, for being able to go for a walk in a park or or you know um, next to a river. So um, that blue green um, links are, are very much there. Um, so yeah. yeah, I am I am pretty sure. I don't have data to support this 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 statement, but I'm pretty sure that people started to acknowledge a bit differently um, uh, nature and the possibility of going to I don't know forest a park or a beach or yeah. something after this this um, this period. I know I did. I know I, I I already knew that it was important for most of us, but it was pretty difficult to yeah. uh, to stay indoors for such a long time and not being yeah. able to you know just take a walk around. Um, yeah. But yeah, I will, yeah. Sorry. I will also say that I know, for instance, in Belgium, that the apartments in 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 Austin at the beach is significantly more expensive now than they were before. Like people really value being able to, well, first of all, being able to go on holiday in your own country, which Belgians don't do very often, but also, you know, being able to just go to the beach when, when you couldn't go very far. Um, so so the, the price of apartments have gone up. They, you can't buy an apartment. You can't rent an apartment in Austin right now. I can. I can absolutely relate. And also the value of a balcony, the value of, a, you know, a backyard. Yeah, so. yeah precisely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah Nick. Thanks, uh, Sheila. Um, so before we go to the next questions from our uh, audience, I would just ask personally, because I was curious about the surveys that you did, I saw that you had replies from around 14,000, I think it was, uh, people who answered the, the survey. Uh, can I just ask, was, was there any trend or any result that was kind of surprising to your group uh, regarding the questions made? I am sure there was, but, but to be honest, it wasn't. I wasn't part of that study, so I don't remember. But if you go to the website, to the Sophie website, which I'll put in the chat, um, the all the papers are coming out now, so so you'll definitely get those results there. But I'm afraid I didn't. I don't no, remember that. So no so problem. I, I think my colleague Anna put the. Um, uh, I know she she put no. the general website Marine Board. I'm but looking yeah, for we'll... it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, meanwhile, Anna, if you want, I can proceed to the next question. Or yeah. Okay. So, from our audience, we have a question from Isabel Marin. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, she says, uh, "Thank you for your presentation, Sheila. Regarding the problem of feeding the human population, I would like to point to the importance of food waste. Some studies have estimated that almost 50% of food produ produced worldwide." is wasted through the food production supply, uh, production supply consumption chain. As far as I know, numbers of waste from fisheries and aquaculture are uncertain. Is the EU considering to evaluate food waste from the fisheries and aquaculture sector among state members? Thank you. Um, I don't know <laughs> because it's not, I, I, I don't speak for the EU, that's for sure. Um, I vaguely remember when they were doing the um, um, farm to fork strategy and the new blue strategy that there was a lot of talk about that so um, whether the EU is doing something I don't know they should they definitely should and, and in fact um, in the in the Sapir report on a food fruit from the ocean that was one thing that was highlighted and certainly it's one of the things that it's always highlighted when you look at the circular economy so I think given that the that the EU has now got the circular economy and, and blue econ sustainable blue economy, I think it's something that, that really should be highlighted. Yeah. I have, um, we are heading towards, towards the end, so I would encourage everyone to leave the, the questions if they still have some questions in the Q&A box. But uh, I have a bit of a curiosity also because in the, in the beginning, you were mentioning the consultation process. And that consultation, it seemed to me that we, it was big, a big process. Uh, how long did you did you take to? I mean, for the survey with the citizens. Um, again, I wasn't really part of the people running it. I think that study ran through Ireland, and I think that they um, they had it open for. Well, I think the survey would probably have only been open for like six weeks or something, but um, yeah. And I know that they had um, surveyed so many countries, but then actually added more countries so that they could wider, um, 
you know, diversity of voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and um, also uh, after the project was done, or even during the, the project, the the time that it was running, uh, did you can you identify any specific? I would not say countries, but any specific uh, policymakers or not people, but any specific like if they are MEPs, if they are um, from from national governments, did anyone? Uh, approached you or anyone in your team saying, okay, we are interested in this, let's discuss this, or do you think that the policymakers are still, you know, just waiting for us to, uh, to approach them and to show them studies like this? I have to say that uh, from a from DG research perspective, they were very, very interested. And when they, um, when they were putting together Horizon Europe calls, um, they really wanted us to, to give them the pre- you know, the, the, the sort of pre-draft so that they really could have something to, to go into that. So from a research perspective, they were very, very interested. Okay. Um, from the other DGs, we haven't, as far as I know, had, I, I don't recall having specific interactions, um, but we have a, at the Marine Board, we have a document on valuing marine ecosystems, which is kind of in the same space. And I know that Digimare is um, very keen on that topic and they have been, you know, um, they've invited me to talk at the Seology, I think it's called, uh, which was meant to happen last year, but, <laughs> but is now postponed for a year. Um, so, so for sure they're they're interested in how do you value marine ecosystems which is sort of related in in this sense um so so they are you know they're very much aware of it and, and, uh, and uh, yeah and at national things. level anything i think i can answer this question myself but did you have well anything? at a national level um from from belgium perspective you know the the studies that are done by Liz is actually funded from the from the national funding from, from belgium so I know, for instance, the PhD student got funding through the PhD program that's a nationally funded program to do the work. So um, in a, it, I, it'll be dependent from country to country. For sure, I think in Belgium, it's being picked up. Um, the studies um, in Britain, for instance, it's not part of Europe anymore, but it was part of this, uh, the project. They have quite a lot of work with I like that. they've done quite a lot of interesting work where they showed that the health benefits um, of living closer to the coast is significantly more for people who have not who don't have money. If you live, if you have a house next to the beach um, and you're rich, then it doesn't really impact your well-being as much as if you live next to the coast and you're poor. If you're rich, you can go anywhere. You can go to Spain if you want. You don't have to stay in Brighton, you know, or in whatever Olapool or something. But if you're if you're poor, then being able to go to a you know place where you can have mental health makes a big difference. So they've had those studies, and actually, I think that um, there is proposals and possibly even projects to look at. Certainly, actually, in Belgium, they also looked at at that interaction, and they found actually that the people living a little bit further from the coast has more health benefits than the people living at the coast because there's a lot of rich people living at the coast uh, in Belgium. So, so yeah, there's differences between countries and, and different um, uh, national policymakers are more or less interested in it. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, in some countries, the oceans are just not important at national level, and, and then it's really hard for them to, to see the see yeah. the yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, in Ireland, it was also quite well taken up by the national level. Okay, okay. So as for my, at least it's my final question. Um, I am I am curious to know whether we were talking about concerns that the, the concerns that people had, <coughs> I'm sorry, that the concerns that people had regarding the ocean as, as a food provider, jobs provider and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, did climate change uh, came, um, uh, did it came up strongly or are people still disconnecting ocean and and climate change or the effect climate change can have on the ocean or ocean acting as a buffer for climate did that i think it definitely came up especially in the surveys i think if you go and look at this strategic research agenda and in the papers 
you'll see that it, it came up for some groups more than for others, for some countries more than for others. Um, and even in the workshops that we had, uh, there were some countries, some, some sea basins, it was more important than others. So I think if I'm not mistaken, it was quite important in the Baltic, but less important, and maybe in the Mediterranean, but less important in the North Sea or something. I can't remember now, but, but there were differences between the different um, sea basins, whether climate change was more important or less important than other um, sort of trends that they saw. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> so, I think we don't have any, you know, we we don't have any more questions. Um, I don't know, Sheila, if you are uh, comfortable with me sharing your email when we send. Um, can I send your email uh, through to the to the attendees yeah. and to yeah, uh, everyone yeah. that registered? Okay, so that if they want to continue this conversation with you, and uh, they can do it. And also, I'm going to share your um, your handle from your Twitter handle so that yeah. they can share uh, whatever information they want about this topic. Um, as for us, I think that's it. Uh, thank you once again so very much, Sheila, for being here. I know that we are still coming back from holidays and every, and we have a lot of work that we need to pick up, but thank you uh, so much for making the time for us. Uh, thank you once again, everyone that attended the webinar. Uh, keep an eye on our social media and our YouTube channel and everything so that you can be uh, informed about our uh, upcoming initiatives. Hopefully, some of them are going to be in person um, but some of them are going to happen here on, on Zoom. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very Thank much. You. Nice to speak Bye. to you guys. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank you. Bye.